Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Marie McCauley from the uh, UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning in Hamburg. I hope you can all hear me well. And can somebody confirm that they can all hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, so welcome and thank you for being here uh, to today's webinar for the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities. Today we'll be focusing on measures developed by cities for migrants and refugees in the context of the COVID-19, uh, looking specifically at uh, measures around education. Um, for those who have been following us for the last a few weeks, this is our seventh webinar as part of our thematic webinar series. And if this is your first webinar with the, the UNESCO JNLC, welcome. Uh, today's webinar will be one hour. We record the webinar at the beginning of every session and uh, the webinar is then uploaded to our YouTube channel. A link will be provided in the chat for you to uh, have access to where we upload those webinars. The format for today is similar to that of uh, uh, last week and the week before. Um, we have individual presentations followed by one or two questions if we have time, otherwise we keep all the questions for the question and answer period at the end of of today's webinar where we'll be taking questions from the audience. Um, if you're interested in hearing from us after this webinar, we really encourage you to sign up to our uh, newsletter. A uh, link will also be provided in the chat uh, for you to sign up directly um, to, to the UIL uh, bulletin. The audience for the webinar is muted, uh, so panelists have access to uh, have the option to mute and unmute, but uh, the rest of the audience will be muted, which is why we really encourage you to use at the bottom of the screen the option um, which I will be monitoring closely and taking all the questions from there for today's uh, question and answer period. And uh, last little logistic note, uh, when you write in the chat bar and not in the Q&A, please make sure that you address um, your question or, or your um, information note uh, to all the panelists as well as all the participants, not just the panelists, otherwise people might be missing out on the information that you're sharing. And little announcement uh, that we're making. Um, so we'd like for everybody to note that the period for the membership applications for the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities is extended for another two months. Uh, this is uh, due to the current situation with coronavirus. We're aware of the difficulties um, that cities are facing at the moment. So uh, cities now have the option to apply until June 30th, 2020. And national commissions have one month until uh, July 31st, 2020 to endorse the procedure. Uh, all of the information is on the website um, and we'll also be providing a link to that website in the chat. And that is all for logistics. So before I introduce our speakers, um, I'll open the floor to my colleague uh, Konstantinos Bagratis from the UNESCO Global Network of Learning City Secretariat, who will give us a brief introduction of today's session. Konstantinos, over to you. Thank you so much, Marie. I hope you can see and uh, hear me very well. Can I... Um, I can only hear you, not see you. Okay, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Ah, that might be something I can work with. Okay, please go ahead and I'll try to fix that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you, Marie. Th thank you very much for this introduction, but uh, also thank you all the participants of the webinar today from all over the world, so good morning and good evening to all. We appreciate a lot this opportunity to come here together in such uh, challenging times when the continued growth in migration and displacement flows around the world can challenge uh, hosting communities. Uh, the national authorities often have um, a stronger voice in international debates on migrants and refugees. However, cities remain the primary destination of migrants and uh, increasingly, I would say, of refugees, but also internal displaced populations. In the context of the pandemic, it is important to know that refugees and migrants, comparatively to other populations, have high risk of contracting the COVID-19 disease because of their living conditions, which are often overcrowded and lack the means to follow basic public health measures. In addition to these fundamental challenges, their uh, inability to speak the local language of the country they find themselves in may also hinder their access to the most updated information about the pandemic. As we know, education has been hit particularly hard by the COVID-19 pandemic with around 1.5 uh, billion learners out of school 
and uh, almost 185 uh, countrywide school closures. Uh, and, that has a, and this has a huge impact on the total enrolled learners population, which is around 88%. Uh, of course, the dropout rates across the globe are also likely to rise as a result of this massive disruption to education access. And given these statistics, there is no doubt that the lack of accessibility to education for migrants and refugees has been further exacerbated in the crisis time. So I'm just trying once again to see if this works. Okay. So thank you so much. I think now you can see me. For today's webinar, we're focusing on the role of the cities in taking um, on the responsibility to support the migrants and refugees in response to the pandemic. And we look forward to hear the different measures, but also strategies that cities are putting in place. Uh, with no further ado, I would like to give the floor to you, Marie, but also to our experts that we have a great panel today. I'm ready to take a lot of notes. So thank you very much and over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. So uh, just for the speakers to note, I'll be operating the slides for today. Uh, we, we received all the different presentations and I'll move on to quickly introduce our speakers before we get started. Our opening speaker, Ms. Jacqueline Strecker, uh, leads the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR, uh, Connected Education Portfolio, an initiative that explores ways to improve quality and expand opportunities for displaced communities. Uh, and she's joining us from Geneva are uh, speakers, all very active members of the Global Network of Learning Cities. We have Ms. Abir Jbeili from the International Affairs Consultant of the City of Baalbek in Lebanon, uh, also a member city of the UNESCO GNLC. Mr. Dimitris Delianis, Chairman of the Larissa City Council, um, a UNESCO Learning uh, City awardee in 2017. Uh, I should note. And uh, our last but not least, uh, this presenter for today will come from us from Medellin. Uh, Ms. Luz Angeles Alvarez Enao, she's the program leader at the Ministry of Social Inclusion, Family and Human Rights, uh, representing the city of Medellin. And just uh, for participants who may not be aware of this, Medellin was a uh, UNESCO Learning City awardee in 2019, but also uh, very importantly, uh, the host city organizer for the fourth International Conference of Learning Cities, which took place last fall, uh, the focus of which was on inclusion and equity and uh, which had a dedicated panel on the topic of migrants and refugees. So we're looking forward to hearing um, how the crisis has affected Medellin since the last time we were with them and worked with them directly on the topic. Uh, so with that, I will now pass the floor to our opening speaker from uh, UNHCR, Ms. Jacqueline Strecker. Great, thank you very much for that um, wonderful opening and the important context. I think as my slides just get loaded up, um, I wanted to say um, a quick thank you to everyone and all of the cities represented on today's call um, for their rapid responses and quick efforts to protect uh, the people residing in their cities and apply holistic and inclusive responses that are including refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants, and are enabling continuous access um, for all uh, to learning opportunities, which is an important uh, component of SGD4, as we know. I think there's been great context that's been given already, so I'm not going to focus on that. But I, what I will focus on today is looking at some of the different learning efforts that are underway to support all learners um, as part of the response. And looking a little bit at the advice and what we've learned from other cities in terms of how we can sequence responses to rapidly address the needs of each city and of each learner. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is some of the feedback that UNHCR and our partners have been sharing. First and foremost, uh, that it's important that we work together. And so we need to just um, develop communication uh, mechanisms. We need to work with national, but also local authorities, uh, with partners, with communities to establish clear communication lines, but also ensure that our efforts are coordinated. And a starting point that we're often seeing within cities is to look at what the national response is first um, and then apply more contextualized standards. So what are the policies uh, regarding school closures around social distancing, um, but also looking at what types of virtual learning opportunities are being made available. 
we think it's really important that we apply a protection lens um, and consider equity principles. Um, we know that there's been a number of measures being put into place, uh, both from a health perspective, uh, but also from a learning perspective to provide support. Uh, but sometimes these efforts actually favor those uh, who have access to resources that refugee migrant communities and other marginalized communities might not. So considering equity is uh, first and foremost. And that leads us to applying a multi, uh, multi mode approach. And so here um, we advise looking at sort of short term and long term remote learning plans uh, and for policies to really assess their systems capacity and the resources that they have and look at what types of different resources are available, what combinations of technologies and different uh, delivery mechanisms can be put into place. Um, so if we go to the next slide, you'll see examples of what some of the different national responses have been, especially when we look at virtual learning. Uh, you see different technologies are being favored at different grade levels. Uh, so with television and radio uh, being favored more for the, the younger levels of learning, with more and more dependency on looking at online um, interactive modes of learning at secondary and at higher education. And so these are important to consider as we look at the responses. So in the next slide here, you're going to see that uh, we really advocate for looking at ways to consider sequencing the responses, um, looking at, as we said before, the different tools, the different stages, where we have capacity, and how we can sustain sort of initial responses that are put into place. UNHCR has issued uh, guidance and we'll make sure that we share the link within the chat on how even low-tech solutions can be applied. So now as we move on, uh, we're going to look at how we sequence the response. Um, and again, this is based off of examples that we see. So on this slide here, you'll see that as part of the initial response, um, the first stage has really been to look at health and protection considerations. And I think the opening framing uh, really brought to light some of the additional challenges and considerations for refugee and host um, hosting communities, uh, as well as for migrants. One of the things that we note also is often for these populations, uh, their potentially only decent meal might come from school feeding programs. And so one thing that we've been advocating for is looking at how additional nutrition support can be put in place um, to ensure people have access uh, to proper nutrition uh, during the COVID response but also looking at for perhaps refugee or migrants who were working uh, as teachers or support staff, how can uh, their salaries be retained so that they also do have some financial stability um, during this. And then very quickly followed on as part of the initial response, looking at what those learning opportunities are. So I know often we're really bombarded by health considerations, which are first and foremost, um, but looking at how individuals can continue learning opportunities all the way up at, for adults and lifelong learners is important. And so one of the things we look at here is how you can promote access uh, to the national programs, so be that radio or television, but how also you can advocate more locally for copies of this, um, these resources and materials so that you can disseminate them in other formats. Uh, and it's really important here if these, uh, this content comes with open licensing uh, so that it can be uh, distributed in offline formats. And we'll showcase uh, some examples of that in a moment. As part of your medium term response, so on the next slide, um, here is ways that you can look at from a city's perspective on how you can amplify what's being done at the national level. And we've seen great examples of this within cities where if the FM signal doesn't reach uh, local communities, they've used more community radio to share out radio broadcasting or to put in place interactive radio instruction uh, using the initial national scripts that have been provided where radio doesn't reach or television isn't accessible, people have been loading content onto SD cards or preloading them onto tablets and being able to share them around and have really been working with teachers and 
um, volunteers within the community to look at how some of this content can be shared. We know language is an issue. There's often a lot of digital resources that can uh, be translated or have subtitles into a variety of contexts. And so how can we use those individuals also as an important resource to help in sharing out this content, but localizing it as well. Um, and this is why it's really important to provide support and continuous support to teachers and caregivers. Um, as well as looking at the next phases, which is opening the schools. So as we move to the next slide and we look at reopening um, schools, we need to be putting in place responses now and plans now, which recognize that individuals might have missed out of months of school, but they also will have benefited differently from remote learning opportunities. So how can we ensure that everyone as they're coming back, um, one, are attracted to return, but also um, are able to provide or receive catch up and remedial support so they can be on par with their peers um, as they're proceeding into examinations or sort of the next phases of learning. And so to do this, it's really important um, that we consider how these wraparound supports through catch up accelerated remedial programs can be put into place and how we can leverage some of the tools and resources that were made available for continuous learning um, in these responses. So lastly, I'll just say that it's important when we look at how systems can recover um, to look at how we can document the experiences we have, how we can use this as a time to identify gaps and advocate for greater uh, public investments. Um, this could be in uh, looking at offline resources that could be put in place, be that um, in community centers, Wi-Fi hotspots and community points, um, how we can also invest in digital literacy programs. We're seeing huge digital divides at the moment. And so it's very important that teachers, learners, and communities are provided with opportunities uh, to enhance their digital inclusion. And I think that's something that's quite clear right now. I'm just going to give one quick example of um, one initiative that UNHCR has been working on. And this has been with an organization called Learning Equality. Um, they have an offline platform uh, that provides a whole range of educational content and we've been working with different ministries and cities to ensure that this content can be mapped to national curriculum and could be made available in a whole series of different languages. On the next slide, you'll see that um, this content, for example, in Kampala, um, has been uploaded on the national server but efforts are underway in cities of Kampala and in Tembe to make sure that through the local hotspots that they've created, um, that people are able to access the platform. So even if they don't have uh, connectivity themselves, they're able to access it. And we think this is a great example of an initiative uh, that's done at a national level, but being localized by cities. So we've got some many other great examples that you're gonna hear from the other panelists. So I'll stop there uh, and I'm happy to share further um, examples for, from UNHCR and to join the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation, Jackie. Really helpful to get that first overview picture and the different tools you've developed, um, both in the context of uh, of difficult, difficult regions to reach with radio broadcasting TV, but also to hear that there's solutions put in place through SD cards, tablets, and other means. Um, really, really interesting first uh, way to start the session on this topic. And uh, now we'll hear from people on the ground in cities. We'll start with our colleague in uh, the city of Albec, Lebanon, uh, Ms. Abir Jbeli. Um, Ms. Abir, if you can hear me, and if you can please go ahead, we'll be loading up your slides in just a second. Um, the floor is yours. There, we can hear you now. Yes. As a consultant in international relations for several Lebanese municipalities, I work as an international affairs advisor uh, to the municipality of Baalbek. I am speaking to you today on behalf of the mayor, Mr. Fouad Balou, as well as the Municipal Council of Palbak. I want to share with you my PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. Okay, quick introduction. Balbak is a city located east of the Litani River in Lebanon's Bekaa Valley. Balbak is home to around 
to 100,000 residents, which include 60,000 Syrian refugees and some 10,000 Palestinian refugees. Baalbek is proudly a member of the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities. In Greek and Roman times, Baalbek was also known as, as Heropolis, the city of the sun. It's home to the Baalbek temple complex, which includes two of the largest and the grandest Roman temple ruins, the temple of Bacchus and the temple of Jupiter. It was described in 1984 as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Municipal responsibilities amid the COVID-19 threat. Similarly to any other country around the world, the novel coronavirus has been threatening Lebanon since mid February 2020. As positive cases surfaced, the municipal authorities stepped up and showed a great sense of responsibility throughout the Lebanese territories. The municipality did not hesitate to take the initiative and put in place the necessary measures aiming to limit the spread of COVID-19. Following the joint effort of the Ministry of Health, represented by Minister Hamad Hassan, the government of Albaq Hermel, Mr. Bashir Khadr, the Municipal Work Committee of the Influential Personalities, the Municipality of Baalbek, took safety measures specifically deployed to provide health security to all, to all its residents equally, whether Lebanese or refugees. You can uh, wait. As the first few cases of COVID-19 surfaced and before the full lockdown was implemented, Baalbek Municipality embarked on a journey of rigorous work aiming to raise awareness through a social media campaign inciting people to stay home and safe, working hand in hand with governmental authorities to ensure safety directives, directives are followed to be later, including wearing masks and gloves following sanitization procedure. The municipality also ensured the high-risk places such as coffee shop, restaurants, and other businesses remained closed to ensure safety. A special, a special message was written by the mayor of Baalbek asking people to abide by the lockdown accompanied with a prayer for the street to subside. A special campaign to urge uh, people to be safe and stay physically distant in their homes. In addition to what previously mentioned, municipality entered two regular sanitization of public spaces, such as the roads, the streets, just the, the shops. To illustrate this in the following, you can see some pictures uh, of the endeavors undertaken the, by the municipality of Baalbek in collaboration with the Islamic Health Society and the Civil Defense. Municipal, you, you see uh, municipal responsibility amid the COVID-19 threat. By mid-March, the Lebanese government took the decision of putting the entire country in lockdown and declaring a state of health emergency. The municipality, including the municipality of Baalbek, the municipalities, including the municipality of Baalbek, took it upon themselves to aid the Lebanese government in implementing the lockdown, ensuring safety measures are followed and curfew hours are observed. Below are a few pictures to illustrate the measures taken to ensure the safety uh, of all the residents of Baalbek, equally whether local and refugee. Checkpoints. Checkpoints were established in the entrances of the city where health personnel ensured that all visitors who enter the city are both healthy and not showing symptoms. Baalbek Municipality Union, in collaboration with the official authorities and the, uh, and the, the NEO within the region, established a health committee te test was visiting the Syrian refugees camps and implement safety measures. Okay, you can see sanitization of tents in Syrian uh, refugee camps. Educational measures for refugees and migrants. 
At the COVID-19 treat emerge, the first sector to be put in lockdown was the educational sector. So currently all schools in Lebanon are closed for the safety of the children. And this stage education is limited to online teaching or broadcasting of the curriculum of the national TV. Before the lockdown, the UNHCR, in collaboration with local educational authorities, were working hand in hand to provide proper education to all the residents in Lebanon equally. The main approach used with the open classroom in the afternoon for the Syrian curriculum to be taught. Economic challenges. The COVID-19 was not only challenging on the level of public health, but also in the economic level. As the country went into lockdown, many people who live on daily wages lost their uh, live, uh, uh, lively, uh, livelihoods, namely the Lebanese who don't not receive regular financial aid as well as food and fuel donation from UN agencies, such as uh, the UNHCR similarly to the refugees in the, uh, in the region. Uh, the, UNH, uh, the UNHCR has played a pivotal role in ensuring safety and security to the refugees by providing financial aid, food, medical attention, education and enrollment and much more to the refugees, especially in the Beka area. Uh, this left the Lebanese residents to fend from themselves and there still isn't a clear plan to dispatch aid to the most needy families. The municipality, as well as uh, local organization, step up to provide food and basic necessities to the most needy. However, as municipalities, like founding uh, the economic situation in Lebanon worsen. These endeavors are not nearly enough to cater for a small portion uh, of the needy throughout the country, whether residents of refugees. Uh, on this note, I would like to highlight a few key figures about Lebanon. Around 40% of the population live below poverty line. Unemployment rates are expanded to hit 50% due to the economic situation. The purchase power of the Lebanese has recently been cut in health due to the failing uh, of the Lebanese currency. The picture after the coronavirus threat subsides is quite grim. Crime. We, come, we count on the help of the international community to persist as a country who never failed to step up and help when help was needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Abia, for this uh, extensive overview of uh, the situation in Baalbek in Lebanon. Um, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll just ask you one question before we move on to our, our next uh, speakers. Um, you mentioned in the presentation that before the lockdown, uh, the UNHCR, in, in collaboration with um, the local educational authorities, uh, were working hand in hand to provide proper education to all the residents of, in Lebanon equally and that the approach was used uh, one of the approaches used was open classrooms in the afternoon for the Syrian uh, curriculum to be taught. Um, do you have any examples or any strategies that have been developed since the lockdown? Has there been measures um, developed despite the fact that obviously there are many competing priorities given the, the crisis at the moment with food and health and security being uh, just a few to name out of the many others? Uh, I talk about the situation in general. We have been a member for, uh, for a year uh, in Learning City UNESCO. Uh, I will send you, I will send you uh, by mail to all four team uh, what, we, uh, what we do uh, in cooperate with with, UN, uh, with the UNHCR, I welcome to all your question related to international affairs. However, given the fact uh, that I am not working on uh, on any project related to the Syrian refugee crisis education, any question on this topic can be sent to my email. I will send you. You have my email ashbeil at yahoo.com. I will personally consult the person in charge to the topic of your uh, question and reply to you with an accurate uh, answer. Okay, and I will, I will prepare, I will prepare and I will send you for you and for uh, Stantin or, or uh, for all the group what we do uh, about uh, the education. 
Thank you so the much. measures about, uh, oui, yes. Okay, merci beaucoup. Je vous en prie. Uh, now uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, joining us from uh, the city of Larissa in Greece, Mr. Dimitri, Dimitris Delianis uh, will be speaking to us about the current situation um, in northern Greece. And Dimitri, okay, you hello. can uh, share me. Yes, thank you. I'll upload your slides now and you can please uh, start. They are members of the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities, participants of this webinar. At first, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for your kind invitation to participate in this webinar, representing Larissa City from Greece. Uh, we are here to share with you our city's experience uh, these three months uh, with uh, COVID-19 and our city's efforts to deal with, as it is possible, this difficult situation. Larissa, our town uh, of uh, uh, 200,000 uh, residents in the center of Greece uh, faces many challenges uh, linked uh, to the financial crisis uh, that has affected Greece over the past uh, decade. Uh, you can see the next card, memorandums, austerity and uh, unemployment. Uh, since uh, 2015, Larissa Learning City, as a member of the UNESCO Global Network of uh, Learning Cities, is promoting uh, actions uh, based on uh, the humanitarian uh, principles of uh, lifelong learning. It is clear that uh, when a city chooses to become a learning city, involves a process of uh, change. Our main aim is uh, to foster the dialogue between uh, city stake stakeholders and citizens and create uh, partnerships, critical thinking and uh, active citizenship. Uh, Larissa Learning City Committee with uh, 75 stakeholders from the civil society provides uh, exactly support and care to vulnerable groups. And uh, that, uh, of course, includes uh, multicultural population as uh, uh, Roma people, uh, trying uh, for their integration in the local society. In Larissa, I must uh, say uh, that uh, live about uh, 4,000 Roma people most of them in a district, district uh, called uh, New Smyrna. Okay, we can see the next. Uh, after the closure of the Balkan route, around uh, uh, 80,000 uh, refugees and immigrants remained in uh, Greece. Uh, from the first the very moment of the refugee crisis, the municipality of uh, Larissa made a big choice. The municipality activated all social structures and services in order to cover uh, basic needs, needs of the people that they were in our need. Networks of local public services, volunteer organizations, uh, social actors and uh, active citizens uh, worked together in respect of uh, human dignity. Next, now, and next, now, after three years, uh, the municipality of Larissa hosts a great number of refugees in a reception center, a, a camp, as you see, in Kutsohero, 25 kilometers far away from the city, with about uh, 1,500 people capacity. Next. Since uh, 2017, uh, the municipality of Larissa, in a collaboration in uh, UNCR, United Nations supports an accommodation program called Estia for 420 refugees in 90 apartments. 90% 90 of them are Syrian. People are additionally supported by social workers and interpreters who help them access medical and educational services, as you see here employment and language courses. You can see some of them activities in the next cards. Move this, please. This was an action of us. Actions on social exclusion. The COVID-19 pandemic has introduced all over the world many challenges and changes. We understand this well, with the vulnerable groups affected the most. 
refugees living in apartments in the town of Larissa and those living in the refugee camp at Kutsochero need to be supported in a daily basis. Our priority was to make uh, sure that the refugees would have uh, valid information about uh, COVID-19. Next, uh, many volunteers and organizations, members of Larissa Learning City Committee, after a public call by the uh, municipality took actions. For example, a team of graduates from Second Chance uh, School of Larissa made masks for vulnerable groups such as uh, refugees. They took also the responsibility to train a group of refugees to work together. One of them uh, shared with us uh, her thoughts. I learned in uh, Second Son School the meaning of words like uh, cooperation, teamwork, the value of giving. And now I share this knowledge with the community. Uh, as you see in uh, this uh, card, uh, for the refugees of uh, uh, STIA program who live in apartments, we also established a two-line uh, 24-hour call center where interpreters give answers and information to the refugees. Volunteers offered help for psychological support. We informed them, all refugees, about safety measures with SMS and brochures with instructions from major health institutions. We gave them door to door cleaning materials like sanitation gloves and masks. Social workers communicate with them every day by video uh, calls and uh, of course our staff uh, visits their apartments to check and cover needs. And of course, there is a constant uh, communication with uh, uh, doctors. The other card, on the other hand, and I, as I said, uh, there is a great number of refugees and uh, uh, migrants in the uh, camp in Kutsohero. Uh, I told you uh, about uh, 1,500 people. Even though municipality of Larissa is a member of the, of the coordination committee, mainly composed of NGOs, municipality did not play a key role during the outbreak of the virus. The Minister of Immigration is in charge of the camp. However, in collaboration uh, with the on-site actors, we gave them door-to-door -door cleaning materials and uh, we tried to inform all the refugees, provide them with the best support and secure that all safety measures have been taken. Of course, uh, we are uh, under lo uh, lockdown situation and uh, in the education system for uh, the last month. And uh, as you see in the next card, uh, education of the refugee children is also a bigger challenge now. Refugee parents were given the opportunity to enroll in the Panhellenic uh, uh, school network with uh, translated uh, instructions in their uh, mother tongues. In cases there, with, uh, there was not uh, possible, the registrations were made by the teachers at, of the school uh, units them, uh, themselves. Of course, there are still uh, a, lot of uh, a lot of problems. You can see the next uh, cards. You can see uh, this. Uh, it was uh, from our uh, uh, teachers. And the, the second. Uh, and of course, uh, I must say that uh, there are still a lot of problems. Many refugee students, especially in the camp, do not have yet access to computers printers or uh, internet. Generally, I could say that the issue of refugees and other multicultural uh, groups has been managed in the Larissa region in a fairly progressive way by the local society and, uh, with synergies. But uh, we still have to face a lot of difficulties. After the first two months of uh, COVID-19 crisis, we now understand well that the cultural differences with the Western culture also affect the hygiene habits and medical procedures. In addition, 
a big number of the population of refugees does not wish to integrate. They think uh, Greece is a transit country and temporary place before their final destination. And of course, as was expected, COVID-19 makes people, Greek people, fear more. That makes people more xenophobic and that creates racism, especially for the vulnerable groups, especially for, for uh, refugees, for migrants. Closing. The days of uh, COVID-19 crisis, crisis highlighted also something else. The big difference in living conditions between the refugees accommodated in the apartments and those living in the camps. And they brought up a survival concern for the less privileged. 15 uh, days ago, 25 persons from the Roma uh, neighborhood who are infected. Central authorities decided to put all the area in quarantine. About 5,000 residents live in this district. 3,500 of them are Roma people who uh, were there. But the Roma people of the quarantine area had been in contact with refugees from the camp in Kutsohero. That's why, at the same time, Karadin was imposed at the camp. Both the Roma people and the refugees who live in the camp share common fate. No matter if Roma people are Greeks and the refugees are not, we speak about vulnerable groups, cultural closed communities with a lot of problems. And of course, the speech of hate is targeting both. I believe that the big challenge for the future is how to communicate and effectively manage these closed communities in order to succeed the integration. Programs like Estia uh, with UNCR, refugees living in apartments, give, we think, that give solutions to quality of life with uh, responsibilities and highlights. It is clear uh, that the solutions are uh, political. We think that uh, the future requires responsive local uh, communities and leaderships. The road is long. It goes through the motivation for action, participate, participation, and of course, decentralization. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Delianis, for this presentation. Um, we, we're a little bit short on time. I would like to ask you a quick a question that would, would typically take uh, maybe a little bit of time to answer, but if you could try to uh, keep it to, to you know, under a minute, that would be great. It's really, well, first of all, the two presentations we just heard really highlight the, the fact that uh, education is a priority, but among so many others that uh, it's quite difficult to find um, how to allocate proper resources for, for such a topic as education, given the other concerns that are ongoing. Um, but it, it's interesting in the city of uh, Larissa that you mentioned the wide range of activities and implemented that you've implemented in your city and that you've managed to create a supportive environment for the refugees, um, uh, both in the city and the region through education. Your last uh, slide is quite striking. You mentioned that despite having managed the issues progressively, there is the question of communication across cultures and the notion of belonging or integration remain key areas for progress. Um, I'm curious to know how do you see the role of the city in finding an answer to those particular challenges and what role have you had in bridging across the cultures and maybe fostering cross-cultural communications in the time of pandemic? And I asked this question in a little bit, and uh, having a bit more context than most people around the table, knowing that you're uh, one of the coordinating leading cities on the topic of global citizenship with uh, the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities. So if you could maybe give us uh, your very quick take on that. I think uh, that uh, we have to see uh, a lot uh, about, uh, how, about the synergies uh, between uh, uh, all uh, uh, the people of uh, Larissa, organizations, how, how uh, we help each other. Uh, and of course, uh, we, we must uh, uh, say that uh, the biggest problem uh, for the future is, uh, as I said, uh, the speech of uh, hate, uh, uh, how is uh, targeting uh, uh, refugees, how is uh, targeting uh, Roma people, how is uh, uh, targeting uh, vulnerable groups. Of course, uh, we have uh, to work uh, on this. We have to see uh, how uh, all the city, uh, all the residents, uh, can manage this 
because uh, the future uh, with uh, uh, socio-economic uh, problems uh, uh, will be uh, tough. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have more questions in a bit. I just want to remind participants before we move on to our next speaker uh, from Medellin that you please use the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screen to ask questions, not the chat, just because we're able to then answer to those or actually pick those questions directly from the Q&A as opposed to filtering through the, the chat bar. So uh, to all the participants, please use Q&A at the bottom of your screen when you have questions to address to our speakers. We'll be asking those just, uh, just in a short while. Uh, right after we hear from, from our colleague, Ms. Luz Angela Alvarez from uh, Medellin's response to the situation in, uh, with regards to migrants and refugees uh, within the context of COVID-19. Uh, Ms. Alvarez, I'll be uploading your slides in just a minute. Can you hear me? And if you so, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Hello, city members of UNESCO. My name is uh, Luz Angela Alvarez, and I'm a program leader, secretary of social inclusion, family and human rights in Medellin City. I'm going to present a uh, good practice in Me of Medellin in relation to the population of migrants and COVID-19. On August 14, 2017, due to the increase in the arrival of migrants from Venezuela, we saw the need to create the module of attending for the foreign population, which was included in the operation of the 123 social line. This line is similar to 911 in another countries. The module of attention to foreign population aims to manage the cases of migrants foreigners and returnees who are in a situation of social emergency in the city of Medellin. Social emergency is understood as a catastrophic situation that happens suddenly in which the person involved do not have uh, the financial resources or support uh, to face it. And that is not attended, the conditions of people in the environment must worsen increasing rice levels. The one to three social model for foreigners addresses the emergency at first, analyzing the feasibility of applying humanitarian aid within the services offered by the one to three social, humanitarian transport, um, shelter, or food plan. And then if required, deliver the case to the indicated programs or entity according to the offer at the municipal level and the service routes. It should be borne in mind that the Mayor's Office of Medellin performs interinstitutional coordination with international cooperation programs, such as those led by an uh, international organization of migrants, uh, International Rescue Committee, the Danish Migration Council, and International Red Cross, in, in, among others. Uh, this has facilitated the activation of routes for critical cases of the population in need of international protections. And in addition, um, with the consulates, there is a link for repatriation in an exceptional cases and documentation management in the case of loss. The model began with a service of three, uh, 344 uh, users during, during 2017 and reaches 6,170 users last year. This shows an important growth uh, in the care provided, both due to the positioning of the model as a point of reference in the city for attention to migrants, as well as the migratory dynamics that appear in relation to the massive uh, arrival from Venezuela migrants to the city of Medellin. Some of the actions are made um, uh, uh, at psychological, psycho psychological care, attention containment, and orientation of migrants uh, by psychosocial professionals by telephone or person or in person. Uh, food delivery for food units a plate of food that is delivering during the attention in, in the territory. Healthcare management, 
search for routes and management with international cooperation and local programs at different levels of healthcare. Humanitarian transport, uh, transport provided to migrants to overcome the emergency to cities where they have a support network or border cities where they seek to return to the country of origin. Uh, another is emergency, emergency shelter. Temporary shelter is provided to users in street situations. Support efforts for, from international cooperation and other entities for economic stabilization. Attention has been uh, given beyond the emergency situation to try to achieve the sociocultural stabilization for the migrant population and integration with uh, host populations. Management with consulates of some countries. Articulation and management for assistance to migrants in support with the consulate for procedures that they require in the process of overcoming the emergency. It is important to highlight to most of the third population is from Venezuela. We also to address cases from the United States, Chile, and all, among other nationalities is stranded in the city, uh, also in a condition of high vulnerability. As an achievement, it stands out to development uh, of resource management actions with important partners, initially in order to strengthen humanitarian transport and emergency shelter services, and later in order to consolidate a partnership and manage, and manage, manage technical resource and financial resources for the implementation of a comprehensive uh, care program for the migrant population uh, by 2020 which aims to gather uh, in needs in the identified in 2019 and incorporate community-based integration actions. The creation of this program emerged from uh, the Institutional Migration Board created last year. In this space, a proposal uh, for comprehensive care of, for the migrants population was formulated for the city of Medellin. This proposal was built in a participatory way by all the members of the board. And later, it was socialized before uh, the GIFM, that is the interagency group of mixed migration, in order to receive contributions and recommendations. And it is a product of the systematization of the liberative construction spaces and complies with the formulation guidelines in a logical framework methodology in order to be presented and socialized, not only by the institutional framework of the Mayor Office of Medellin, but before national and international cooperation organizations, since it intends to transcend being a program of the local administration to be a program of several strategic partners who share a missionary objective uh, to address the migratory reality in the city of Medellin. The activities and achievements of the Institutional Migration Board are set out below. The Institutional Board was created within the Mayor Office of Medellin, led by the Secretariat for Social Inclusion, Family and Human Rights. The purpose of this board is to carry out and coordinate joint action between the different dependencies and agencies that serve the migrant population taking into account the programs and services. For the constitution of this board, a call was made to the different dependencies of the major office, uh, where the assignment of a responsible person for each dependency was requested, as well as information of the care of migrants population in the government terms. The budget allocations uh, for this and the challenges and barriers that have been encountered in the provision of services. The result of this round table was to obtain a complete program of care of the migrant population in a logical framework, which was subsequently socialized and nurtured by the recommendation of uh, and reviews of the organizations that are part of the interagency group on mixed migration flows. This program is led by the Secretary of Social Inclusion, Family and Human Rights, 
and it is connected with the development plan for the next four years. After the emergency declaration due to the pandemic caused by COVID-19, the Secretary for Social Inclusion, Family and Human Rights has strengthened the actions that were being generated from this model for the care, for the care of migrants, which has been an excellent tool when targeting the population to be served. In addition to this, work with international cooperation agencies has been strengthened to strategies of monetary transfers, uh, food delivery, and temporary accommodations for this population. This pandemic situation has generated in Venezuelan migrants uh, the desires to return to, to his country. Um, this, since this measure of social isola isolation was taken, the condition of poverty in this sector has been increased due to lack of income, since most of them were dedicated to informal, informal work. Due to this situation and in coordination with the uh, immigration authorities and the accompaniment of international organizations, humanitarian transport has been provided to the border by groups of people who previously made their request. The respective health screening is carried out the transverse conditions are verified for this to be carried out uh, with all the pertinent protection measures. And humanitarian corridor was opened for them with the support the, of the police authorities and the mayors of the other municipalities through these buses pass so that they can reach to the border. Ms. Luz, you just have a few seconds left. In this way, Medellin has been giving the humanitarian response to the migrant population, especially to the Venezuelan brothers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you for, for that uh, extensive presentation on, on Medellin. Um, it's again something that seems to be quite recurrent across all cities is really the fact that there are so many other issues to uh, contend with uh, other than education and while our, our um, webinar for today is really supposed to look at uh, responses in the context of education with uh, regards to the crisis uh, it's quite interesting to see how uh, all of these different issues are really interrelated uh, we've received quite a few questions on the q a so without further ado because we're, we're a bit short on time i'll start asking them right away um, I can also notice that some people have been active answering the questions on the Q&A chat. So um, let's start with a, um, a kind of a general question. Uh, maybe if you could please tell us how, uh, and this is something we've heard in different uh, webinars uh, now, can you tell us how you're responding to uh, early child, uh, childhood education, educa or childhood education uh, for migrants and refugees? Uh, we can start with you. Um, and uh, uh, Medellin, Ms. Luz Angela, for, um, for that. If you have uh, a few res or a response, uh, a few seconds, you could, uh, you could share with us. Sandra can help us to, to answer that question. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I also, uh, in the, I am in the team of uh, Luz Angela. We are working in the municipality, in the Agency for Cooperation and Investment, also working with the Secretary of Education. Uh, in the city, we have different programs. Um, especially for uh, those kids that are in the uh, studying their process, we have uh, the program that is Good Start. Then the Good Start program uh, try to support all the population from the zero to five years. I am saying zero years because also for the mothers, we have a specially process to uh, provide them the support before becoming a mothers. And uh, this is why we have different programs uh, related to the, um, uh, to the kids. Uh, if there are kids uh, in condition of vulnerability, also we support them. If we have kids of those, of those uh, ages uh, that are uh, with um, any, for example, a special um, population as in Indians or um, have uh, conditions of immigration, then in the city, everything is related with the needs 
and with the population that requires that support. After uh, those kids, we also have another programs in the schools, then everything is connected based on the needs. Thank you so much for that quick uh, and concise response. Uh, if we can maybe get uh, Mr. Deliantis' response to this question. Um, uh, I'll just unmute you. There we go. We can now hear you, I think. No, we cannot. There. Yes. You, you can repeat the, uh, the we question. Can yes. Yes, uh, if you could just provide examples of strategies to, uh, put in place or um, methods for how you've been responding to um, the need of migrants with regards to early childhood education, migrants and refugees. We have given guidance in the camp, of course. And, uh, the, and the, we, it's a big difference between uh, the refugees in the camp and the refugees in apartments. The refugees apartments can uh, uh, send uh, their uh, uh, kids uh, in our kindergartens in the city. Uh, we have a, a kindergarten in the camp, but you understand that uh, uh, it's a big difference uh, how uh, these uh, uh, kids uh, have uh, icons, uh, images of the city, uh, how they understand uh, the language, our habits, uh, our customs. Uh, they are uh, members of our society. Uh, so, uh, in uh, my uh, presentation, uh, I wanted uh, to uh, to tell you uh, that uh, it's uh, the, the, the biggest bet for uh, the future is uh, how this. Uh, uh, program uh, with the uh, UNCR uh, would be a good uh, solution uh, for the refugees crisis. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe we can get uh, Ms. Uh, Jackie Strecker's uh, perspective on this briefly before we move on to the next question. Sure, of course. Um, so we've seen some really exciting programs that are being offered by different cities and different actors for early childhood. Um, again, you're seeing a lot of radio programming and even television broadcasts that are being aimed at uh, early grade learners. We've also seen some initiatives. Uh, there's one that UNHCR is partnering with. Uh, that's a campaign right now called Translate a Story. And this is an initiative that's trying to translate uh, books that uh, individuals see as part of the national curriculum into uh, a whole series of different languages. It's part of the Global Digital Libraries Initiative um, and people are, are part of this, including refugees and migrants, part of this campaign to translate these resources into multiple languages. Um, so not only their communities, but other communities can have exposure to these uh, early grade reading books. We've also seen initiatives uh, for play-based learning, and there's a lot of support, particularly for early grades, to look at how games can be used to keep them motivated um, and directed in these sort of self-directed opportunities. So Can't Wait to Learn by War Child Holland is one example that's being used throughout a number of cities, um, also I believe in Lebanon, uh, to really help support early grade readers to uh, develop foundational mathematics and literacy skills during this time. Thank you so much. Um, I'll move on uh, just because we're, we're quickly running out of time to another question. That was briefly answered already in the Q&A, but I think we could ask this question to everybody. Uh, there was a request um, if one, if all of the participants could demonstrate a teaching learning process within a given cla uh, class uh, in the camps. Um, so Mr. Deliannis, if you could just share a brief answer uh, to that question to all the participants, that would be great. We can start with you. Oh, you're muted again. There, we can hear you now. After uh, the crisis uh, with uh, COVID-19, we have a lot of problems uh, because of uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, our uh, students don't have uh, uh, any possibility uh, connection uh, uh, with the uh, internet. So this is a big problem. Uh, we told uh, this uh, to other uh, actors of uh, uh, the camp, uh, and uh, we have uh, to see how we can overpass uh, this uh, problem. But it's a big problem, not, on, not only for the camp, it's a big problem for uh, many uh, children in our city. 
that, uh, that did not uh, have connection with the uh, internet. Thank you. Um, in maybe Ms. Sandra Diaz and Ms. Luz Angela, if you wish to comment on uh, how uh, the learning processes occur in a, in a given class in different camps. Um, yes, we have a lot of challenges, uh, but especially we, uh, we have now the, the goal of supporting among different institutions to provide those contents of learning uh, for example, by radio, or if it's possible, by um, other tools at, at TV. Uh, but the most important is now we are having like a teamwork with parents in their homes uh, for them also to provide uh, their children uh, good activities. Um, but yes, the connectivity is also a challenge. And we are working so hard to continue the process of education. Uh, and especially we see something. Uh, education is not only in the schools, education and uh, the main object, objective of this network is like learning cities. Then how a city also can provide good opportunities for their citizens, their children to continue learning um, in the middle of this situation. Then we also see as a positive uh -huh. the that this uh, COVID-19 is giving us because we need to rethink the way how we are acting how we are building the progress of our cities. And finally, an example is this webinar. Uh, we are here sharing different perspectives from different parts of the world, and this is amazing. And just to let you know that Medellin is really open to continue sharing with you, um, to continue the experience of the uh, 2019 last year with the event. And we want to continue learning from your experiences, from your good results because we are one city, but one world. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a few more questions. Uh, time is running out, but I will try to ask, hopefully, just uh, two more. We have one uh, question um, directly for uh, Jackie Strecker. Um, the question is, refugees, migrants, and uh, displaced populations, uh, situations are diverse. However, in many cases, they move around as families and communities. How do you ensure that your education interventions involve the whole family and community? Uh, this uh, question also comes to us uh, from um, the context of last week or the week before uh, we had a webinar on family and intergenerational learning and the role of family within the COVID-19 context, especially in providing and continuing education. So if you could maybe uh, speak to that, uh, uh, Jackie, and then we could hopefully get other perspectives um, if available to us today. Sure, and I'll try to be as uh, concise as possible. I think that's an excellent question. I think Sandra touched on that a little bit in terms of uh, looking at the modalities for home-based learning and how parents can actually play an active role in these responses. And that's what we're really seeing. Um, I shared a series of offline tools as well. Um, and I think these tools and resources and those that are being shared at the national level and across cities um, really take a community response and I think that's what makes um, the the response to COVID so interesting at the moment because it's really an opportunity to innovate but to involve uh, communities families within the learning journey and the experience um, that includes helping to localize different materials that are being shared translating them into um, different languages or helping to localize them to a city context uh, to an individual learner context and parents can play a role in this but learners actually play a role in this to helping their parents, even grandparents, understand the information, learning new languages. And I think this is really a time and an opportunity uh, where those intergenerational uh, learning linkages can really be established and honed. And I think it's up to us to identify ways that that can also be mainstreamed when schools do start um, and then they're reconnected. I think one of the benefits that we have, as uh, the, the person asking the question rightly noted, is communities are moving together. Um, and in this way, 
I think they have an opportunity to share uh, unique aspects about their uh, culture, their experiences, and bring that into the learning experience as well. Um, and so we've had this as a, a good moment to, even where connectivity isn't possible, where people can share out um, different cultural perspectives, um, read the materials and appropriate the materials in different ways uh, to help resonate and bring out the own individual experience of all of those that are engaging with the materials. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think I, I can pass that question over to Sandra Diaz as well. If you want to briefly touch on that, you did mention uh, those points a bit earlier, but if you care to uh, just expand a tiny little bit. Yes, but why not? Uh, it's like the conclusion is like, uh, COVID-19 is a great opportunity to work in together and uh, to um, take it out the boundaries. Like we are um, a network that for me is so powerful. We are the learning cities. Then uh, it is the opportunity to, uh, to take all the resources we are working on, all the experiences, and to start showing our cities good results because we have like the power and the ability to connect great ideas with great actions. Then many thanks for uh, this invitation. Uh, it's really, really important for us uh, to see that all of you are fine, that our cities will continue working together uh, and from Medellin and around uh, us, uh, our doors are open to continue working. Then many thanks for the invitation and for the great job that the network is doing. Thank you for that, Sandra. It's really helpful uh, to hear, and and it makes I'm sure all of the team uh, listening to the webinar really happy that uh, we're able to provide uh, this platform for exchange, like you say, and the ability to share. Um, I, I'd like to ask, uh, I think, one more question. I'll try to blend them together if that's an option. But a question has come to us. Um, we'll start with Mr. Delianis, maybe on this one. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll make it uh, two questions. So what strategies do you have to protect the funding that was or is available to your educational projects uh, to the vulnerable groups, especially as given the crisis, a lot of the plans may have refocused their attention to national and local economy and protection of jobs. Um, so what would your uh, what would your plan or strategy be for ensuring funding remains? Um, and uh, I'll ask this uh, other question simultaneously. How are cities supporting migrants and refugees to keep them in a healthy atmosphere despite the confinement? Um, Mr. Delianis? Like it says in Greece, uh, Greece uh, has uh, a financial uh, crisis uh, uh, over the past uh, de uh, decade. Uh, and uh, we tell uh, uh, always that uh, we have a lot of problems all these uh, 10 years but uh, not uh, solutions. Uh, we have to see uh, how we can uh, find uh, these uh, solutions. And uh, I think that uh, when uh, we start our, uh, uh, our uh, program with Lagis Alegni City, uh, one of uh, the best uh, solution was uh, uh, to promoting uh, actions uh, all together. Uh, how we build uh, uh, networks uh, between uh, organizations, uh, uh, between uh, uh, private, uh, private uh, uh, sector, uh, and of course, uh, municipality. Uh, how you can find uh, solutions uh, that uh, no one can stay uh, alone. Uh, so uh, we have uh, to overpass uh, this uh, difficult uh, problem uh, altogether. And I think that this is the meaning of a learning city and uh, how it works in a uh, uh, financial crisis uh, in Lagos and uh, perhaps in the, uh, I can say, say the, the, the same and the, the other uh, cities uh, of uh, this uh, network of uh, UNESCO. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I, I am aware, uh, Ms. Abir, that of the, the difficulty in, in answering questions. If you feel like taking the floor uh, to answer any of these questions, you're more than welcome to go ahead. Um, but I'm just keeping in mind your comment from earlier. Um, so I would like to just hear maybe uh, closing uh, remarks on this last question, because it's quite interesting if
if anybody has developed strategies, I'm sure uh, Jackie could speak to this, but how are, how are cities um, or institutions, groups monitoring the effect effectiveness of online learning and digital learning among the refugee and migrant population, especially now that schools are closed? Um, maybe we can start with Sandra on this one. Uh, maybe 20 seconds, please. Um, effectiveness, we are in the process to do so because we start with the content. Second, we include the uh, challenge of connection. And because we are on that process, then uh, I will be more than happy to provide you good results in the next uh, coming weeks because now uh, is like the, the beginning, I could say that. That's a very, very fair point. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Delianis, if you care to comment 20 seconds on the last question. We have to learn from this crisis. We have to learn from a financial crisis. We have to learn from a refugee crisis. And uh, we understand that uh, if uh, uh, we can't uh, uh, understand that uh, uh, migrants and refugees has the same uh, fate as uh, any uh, citizen of our city, uh, nobody can overpass uh, this difficult uh, situation. Thank you. Uh, Jackie, uh, last 10, 20 seconds, if you care to comment on that, but... Um, I would just echo what other participants have said, and I think establishing feedback loops. So having those communication channels for people to report uh, if they're having difficulty and always preparing to iterate on your response plan so that you can adjust uh, to ensure that your responses are reaching as many people as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for a really helpful uh, and really interesting discussion uh, with lots of tools, strategies shared. Um, as you, uh, as most of you know, and if some of you don't, um, I'll just let you know that the webinars are recorded, uploaded to our website, UIL channel. Um, we also draft and prepare for everybody a uh, summary report of all these webinars. So. Uh, in those, you will find the different strategies mentioned today, uh, along with links uh, to the different websites. And um, we, we do our best to really put everything together, and, and uh, we hope that these are useful for all of you. Uh, and, and as Sandra mentioned, our role is really to create this platform of uh, discussion and information exchange. So um, please feel free to review uh, the website after the webinar. Uh, in the next coming days, you will see the uploaded uh, summary report from this particular webinar. Um, without further ado, I'll now uh, uh, provide uh, Constantinos with the floor for closing remarks, and I would like to thank everybody uh, for having been on this webinar. Thank you very much, Marie, but also thank uh, all the presenters uh, of this webinar. I, I found all the presentations truly inspiring and very, very interesting. I took a lot of notes, and I'm sure the participants also were highly engaged. I saw a lot of questions in the Q&A section, but also um, <clears throat> was a lot of interaction and engagement. From my side, from our side, from UNESCO side, I would like to emphasize the fact that meeting the education needs of migrating, displaced, but also hosting populations requires collective and coordinated efforts at local, um, national, regional, but also international level. Uh, not only this, but also across the sectors, such as health, nutrition, uh, livelihoods, education, all levels of education, including early childhood and lifelong learning. And this has a huge, and this has a direct impact on the lives of the people who are affected. Um, the world is moving to this direction, and UNESCO, together with other UN agencies, such as UNHCR, who is also um, part of our panel today, are uh, they are we are leading this discussion, and through partnerships, we are trying to constantly respond to the crisis, and we do that. And um, UAL, together with UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities, will is contributing on a daily basis to this emergency response and will um, respond uh, soon with a compilation of a case studies from selected uh, cities, uh, members of the Global Network of Learning Cities. This is from my side. Thank you very much, everyone, again, and thank you, Marine, and all the participants. And um, you will hear from us very soon with the report of the webinar as long as the recorded message of this. Thank you so much.